we are live now. Are we live? Yes, yes, we are live. So welcome back, fantastic people. Thanks for the perseverance post lunch. We have like members joining us from different parts of the Asian continent. And now we will focus a bit more on raptors. There are other birds here as well. Endangered one, which is which many people place as the most endangered bird, like great Indian bustards in South Asia. So we have like roughly 150 birds left in the wild. So like don't go away. And if some post-lunch snooze buttons switch on, like use your coffee mugs to full forth. I will pass it over to Nikita now, who will introduce our next speaker. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, the next speaker for our afternoon session is Dr. Alina P. Schneider. After defending her PhD in physiology from Novosibirsk State University in Russia, due to her love for birds, Dr. Schneider shifted her field to ornithology and joined the Russian network for the study and protection of raptors. She now participates in projects to restore the genetic diversity of the Saker falcon studies the steppe eagle and also monitors the black vulture population in Altai in Western Siberia. The title of her talk is Steppe Eagle, Telemetric Studies on its Migration and Threats on Flyways. On to you, Dr. Schneider. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. So I'm Elena Schneider and uh, I'm representing Russian Raptor Research and Conservation Network. And here I will show you our research on migration of step eagles by means of telemetry. Okay, I should share my presentation. Okay, and let's start. So, uh, since 2009, our team conducts surveys on step eagles, follow its population trends, mark threats, and uh, run conservation actions. An important role of our research is uh, studying of eagles flyways. And uh, there is a step eagle population uh, nowadays in a critical condition, and it needs immediate actions. Here you can see on the map uh, the remains of its global breeding range, and uh, most of its population are as declining. Here, the red color or as extinct, that's a gray color. So today, the population of step eagle is estimated as 37 breeding, uh, 37,000 of us breeding Sorry, pairs. Enough, Lena. Yeah. Can you uh, like put it on the full presentation mode? Like it is still on editable mode for us. Really? Oh, but for me, it's... Uh -huh. oh, is it only at my end? Uh, yeah, for, for my side, it's up. No, we could also only see her presentation. We couldn't see the full screen. You can see the full screen? No, we couldn't. Can you try sharing oh. again? Hmm. That's French. One moment. Let me try to stop the sharing. Yeah. Um, and share it again. So I tapped it. Then I'm going to Zoom and I start share. Uh, is it work now? Yes, yes, we can. So now it's in a full mode. Oh, oh, yes, oh, it's in full oh screen. perfect. Great. Okay, thank you. So uh, nowadays, the global population of Stepigal estimated as 37,000 breeding pairs, but 50 years ago, it was at least three times higher. And only two population remain stable. That's that over 20 years. It's stable over 20 years. It's uh, one in uh, here in Altai Sayan ecoregion and another one between Aral Sea and Caspian Sea. So it's a deserted area. 
uh, with the low level of anthropogenic threats. So in 2015, step eagle was finally uh, listed as endangered species, and it gained more international attention and research priorities. So to reveal the threats that push the species uh, into depression, we got to study more of step eagle ecology and at first its migration pathway. Uh, in our work, we use different uh, models uh, of uh, GPS, GSM trackers with solar panels from different manufacturers. Uh, Step eagle is a large bird, so we can use uh, trackers weighting from 30 to 35 grams with no problems. But uh, our experience um, also cover smaller birds like booted eagles and sacred falcons. And actually we have experience with working with other products. In this research, our main uh, model that we use is the one produced by the Aquila company. The one uh, show on the right picture. So this uh, tracker weighting 33 grams with a big solar panel that is very good for step eagles. Um, so uh, in 2013, we started our preliminary uh, studies and followed them until 2016. In 2018, uh, we start the major part of our research and it's currently in progress. We tag birds mostly from um, Southern Siberia. It is uh, that, that region and few birds from central Kazakhstan and uh, two birds from Volga region of Russia. So uh, we collected uh, 51 autumn tracks migration, uh, autumn migration tracks, sorry, and 44 um, spring migration tracks. We um, carefully proceed them and um, found some interesting results. Unfortunately, five eagles died before they complete even their very first autumn migration. So we got nearly no data from them. So what we found that um, the major winter locations of step eagles from our population are Western India and Pakistan. Then uh, 10 eagles spent, usually spent eagle uh, winter here. Then uh, Central Asia, right here. Also, we have six eagles uh, regularly wintering in this area. The other region is um, Middle East. In the Middle East, we have four eagles wintering and three birds winter in Africa, in Northeastern Africa. And the less popular options for wintering as uh, spending winter on the south of the breeding ranch right here. And there are also one bird who did very strange thing and start migrating straight north across the Himalaya mountains and found himself in Nepal. And it's not depicted on this map, but I can show you everything because we have all these birds online. I will uh, show you now. Here, you can see, I hope you can see, right? You can see my browser with yeah, migration yeah. tracks, perfect. Yeah. So here we have all these birds on the map and anyone can open this website and check where our eagles are doing right now. It's possible to check one bird after another, season after season and see what they're, wh where they were and what they're doing right now. So I want to show you uh, that interesting bird who uh, start moving north straight from her natal area. It's very unusual. You remember, yeah? So the um, picture, the, the normal uh, migration map look like this. And here is our shaman female. She moved uh, straight south from breeding, uh, from natal area, crossed Himalaya mountains and spent winter in Nepal, Bhutan and India, very unusual case. So let's return back to my presentation. 
button. That's it. Okay. So now wait for not. I'm trying to. Sorry, it's not moving. Yeah. Okay. So uh, by analyzing the flyways of these 26 eagles uh, and their behavior, we found that eagles used to change their winter insides even between eastern and western grounds. So we have some birds with low fidelity to wintering grounds and some birds with high fidelity. The one with low fidelity, they can easily change, for example, from Iran to Ethiopia, from Saudi Arabia to Yemen, uh, sorry, to Sudan, or from India and Pakistan to Yemen. While some other birds um, use the same winter insights year after year. Here you can see the birds, and here's a very um, uh, important winter insight here and here. So some birds have low fidelity to winter ground, some have high fidelity. And uh, so we conclude that the choice of migration route is not strictly determined by genetic. They are much more dependent on the weather and geographical features. And here is a good example. That's the migration route of two siblings, of two brothers from one nest. And they choose completely different migration strategies and winter insights. Brother seen the blue line, he stopped at the foot of the mountains and don't want to go further. While his brother, Min, he easily crossed the mountains and prefer to spend winter on the seashore. Min, uh, he exposed a high fidelity to his winter inside and returned every year to the same spot. While Min, his brother, he searched for a new location every winter. Seen, he used to make a short and rational migrations from winter inside to the summer area and back, while means circling in over big loops over summer grounds. So very different behavior of birds with same genetic, uh, with same genes. So the environmental factors and individual features are very important. And here is another funny example of, uh, the, of how weather factors can influence migration growth. This eagle named Kenjik. And uh, again, I'll switch to um, the website with birds migration and show you his track. So the Kenjik track, here it is. So on the first year of his life, he went uh, to India and found a good spot for winter near Ahmedabad. But next year, ever, he seems to be heading back to the same position, but suddenly he changed his um, um, direction and headed north. And then he found himself in Bikaner. So what has happened? We were really intrigued about this. And we found what it, uh, what the, the clue of what has happened on the weather focus side. So I came back to my slideshow and I hope you can see the full screen. And here, so can so, they can um, No, <laughs> we can't see full screen. We can only see the full screen. Um, Wow, so that's quite difficult for me. What has happened? Um, sorry. Um, and I will find again. Okay. I will. I will. I will. I will manage it. I will. I will. I did it once. <laughs> I will do it again. Ah, here. Okay. There, here. So you can see, you can see that Kanji on his migration, uh, he faced a super cyclonic storm Kiar that was raging in Arabian Sea. And to escape it, he had to abruptly turn north and then to search for a new wintering spot. So that's how the weather uh, make the bird to 
change his wintering ground. And on the next year, he again choose um, the spot near Bicaner because it's quite a good spot, we all know, I think. So next, uh, we conclude that uh, the, what, what we can see that steppigals from a quite small breeding population in southern Siberia could be found in a very vast area of the arid zone of Eurasia, but that exposed them to a lot of threats. Um, the, since 2013, we lost 13 birds out of 26. The most common cause of death is electrocution, and I think you all know that it's really very important factor that kills a lot of birds of very different species all around the world. And that's a very big issue to cope with this problem. And, and step eagles are very vulnerable to uh, electrocution. Then another threat, another that kills three of our eagles, that's shooting. Just Illegal shooting with no purpose, people shoot the birds flying above with absolutely no reason. So that's a kind of human behavior is uh, could be observed in many countries like in Georgia, in many countries of um, Northern Africa, in uh, Kazakhstan, sometimes in some countries of Europe like Cyprus or Croatia. So people just shooting. Uh, passing birds with no reason, and it's a threat that's really difficult to cope with. Um, six other eagles, we don't really know uh, what was the main cause of their death, so it could be trapping. Our studies on other species of eagles show that the trapping is very um, serious threat in countries like Sudan and Yemen. People uh, capture eagles to sell them for taxidermy or for well kind of a, as a pet so I interrupt you Lena, but like we have less than a minute left oh sorry we don't <laughs> no, want actually, it to end but <laughs> yeah i'm oh, sorry um actually that um the love the step eagle is go look is, seems to be one of the most um, vulnerable species because its migration patterns are uh, um, they have it have slow moving speed on migration and it uh, made a lot of stops on migration and uh, winter inside uh, uh, it spend uh, cover big areas on summer. So uh, we found that in terms of winter and summer movements that correlate negatively with survival rates. So the bigger area that cover during the year, the more vulnerable to anthropogenic threats it is. And the step eagle is the species that is most vulnerable among uh, other species of eagle like golden, imperial, and great spotted. Well, also this um, uh, telemetry study uh, reveal a new threat that is coming uh, in the future and uh, could significantly decline the population of step eagle. That's uh, wind farms. Wind farms are building now in Asia and sometimes they're building, the, they are building on uh, the migration corridors in very important migration areas that could influence hundreds of birds. And uh, today, today, uh, one of our important goals is to promote bird safety requirements on rapidly developing wind farms in Asia. So um, also I want to say a big thanks to Indian photographer Nirav Bhatt. I use some of his pictures in this presentation and he provides us with a lot of interesting information by photographing birds from our research. Uh, on the wintering grounds in India. So thank you very much. And here's some interesting links that uh, you can use. Thank you. I'm done. <laughs> and cut you short because this was so fascinating, like connecting not only for species, but also in terms of how fascinating it was to understand 
like movements of birds, understanding individual variations and even variations along the lifetime as multiple individuals responded to stochastic events as well. So okay. I guess it will be a fantastic panel discussion towards end where I will cover this. But an important question coming your way, like tries to explore the threats which are like which you can think are very like heavily impacting step eagles in particular. People are interested in understanding the degree of sight fidelity between males and females. So this is the uh -huh. question from Chris Powden, and you have like a lot of thumbs up for your work. And like Thank that, you. to you and your team as well. <laughs> yeah. Rest of the questions you can handle on the score. Yeah, I will. Yeah. So yeah, can you like comment about the threats? Uh, right now, I have time. Oh, few seconds. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, I was uh, actually thinking about uh, replying in this card and then. Okay, then. I okay. can give links to uh, papers that we publish on this work. So that uh, sounds fantastic. Yeah. So, like our listeners, if you're interested in Dr. Schneider's work, please poke her on Discord and she will be kind to respond. Thank you. Wonderful. Then. Thank you. Over to Niketa. Can you unmute yourself? Hi. Our next speaker is Debanjan Sarkar. He completed his master's degree from FRI at the Heradur and is currently a PhD scholar at the Wildlife Institute of India. He has previously studied the northern swamp deer and helped assess the tiger corridor functionality using landscape genetics and modeling. The title of his talk is Tracking the Rainbird. Telemetric studies on the pied cuckoo. Thank you. Over on to you, Devanjan. Hello, everyone. I'm Devanjan from Wildlife Institute of India. I'm a PhD student working here mainly on climate change and protected areas. But today I'll be talking about the project I'm currently working on, uh, tracking the rainbird or tracking the pied cuckoo using satellite telemetry techniques. Pied a summer migrant to uh, northern India and a brood parasite bird. Brood parasite bird means uh, it lays eggs on different birds and uh, the host bird actually raises its offspring and uh, feed them to the till they are young. Uh, this, this species has more than 40 recorded hosts in its entire range. However, the major host of the bird, uh, bird is mainly babbler and the bulbul. Apart from this uh, interesting uh, brood parasitic behavior, the bird is summer migrant to India. It appears in the northern parts of India and stays till the monsoon period. And this is known for centuries in different folklore and mythology. However, there has been very limited studies on its migration. One of the early studies is done by uh, Whistler uh, in 1928, where he pinpointed observation throughout India and circuit location where it is observed seasonally. As you can see in the map, he has observed uh, locations uh, he has pinpointed the locations and uh, or the marked them in circles and the where the circles are marked, uh, there the species uh, observed is uh, observed seasonally. However, in southern part of India, the species is uh, resident. After later, MD Madhusudan used precipitation data with EBER data to correlate its relation to its monsoon. As you can see, uh, the bird actually started ar arriving in the month of uh, May to the northern India and stays uh, till uh, October to uh, uh, September. Uh, then there's this latest uh, word by Bird Count, where it shows how the bird has its dynamic distribution throughout its range. It still leaves a question whether the movement path of the species is through the Arabian Peninsula through the landmass or it takes the sea. To answer the question, we use satellite telemetry to see its migratory route. We use two grams uh, solar PDT to understand its migratory route. Uh, it is one of the lightweight uh, satellite transmitter available till date. It connects to the Argus group of satellites. And how it works is the bird tagged with the transmitter. Uh, the transmitter uh, relays the data uh, relays the data to the Argus satellite. 
the satellites then sends the data back to the processing center. Uh, from the processing center, the location fixes are sent to the user. It mainly the lat long of the data, and apart from some auxiliary information like the class of the data, altitude of the data, uh, things like that. So the and the user can the down can download the data from the Argus website. We started our survey in the May first week, looking for the bird and sites for its vicinity. So once you observe the species, so uh, once we observe the uh, observe an individual in a particular site, we uh, uh, kept up the observing the birds for a regular basis to see whether it's coming or not in a uh, certain spot. And uh, we selected site which has a potential for the, the mist netting. So once the site was selected, we placed mist nets at uh, in different places within the selected site, and we used uh, 32 mm nets as well as 22 mm nets uh, to maximize our chances of capture. And apart from the mist net, we used uh, uh, model replica and uh, call. So we faced uh, difficult, different constraints uh, during our entire uh, um, misstating uh, uh, duration. So uh, first of all was the bird is present only during the monsoon. And regular rainfall and uh, winds actually makes it very difficult uh, for misstating during the monsoon period. Uh, next difficulty what we faced was the small capture window. Uh, uh, because within its time frame of staying, only the pre breeding season is suitable for misstating. Because at that time only, it responds to the call playback, probably thinking it's a rival or a potential mate. So after the pre breeding season, uh, they tend to perch on the higher canopies and usually don't come down. Uh, then there were instances where the uh, bird slipped through the nets and we, are, we had to shift from 32 mm net to 22 mm net to maximize our chance of capture. And there were times where the bird perches on the mist net ropes, as you can see from the picture. We finally captured two birds in uh, July 2020 after daily attempts for uh, over uh, two months. Once captured, we took the birds' measurements and uh, tagged them with uh, satellite transfer. We also put uh, color rings on its legs. Uh, the bird was named uh, Chatak and uh, Meg to emphasize its relations to uh, folklore and the race. And the birds were uh, released at the capture site. Both the birds started giving location the day it was tagged. However, one individual stopped responding uh, after one month while it was still in Delhi. The second uh, bird actually kept giving the data. It started. Uh, it started its migration uh, from Dehradun uh, on in October. It started its migration from Dehradun in October midweek, uh, with one day stop uh, uh, near the Rajaji National Park, and then it kept uh, going uh, southward and moved uh, uh, near. Uh, and had a stopover site for one month at the site uh, B and uh, near the Maharashtra. From Maharashtra, it went till uh, the coast of Goa and uh, it stayed there for one month. And uh, at the end week of the November, it started uh, uh, crossing the Arabian Sea. However, the last location we received was near the coast of Somalia. Although the bird was tagged only for a few uh, months, the study already gave us few new insights. First of all, the bird stays till the month of October. So we assume that the bird, as it is a brood parasite and it doesn't have a parental care to do, so it supposedly should leave immediately after the it has laid its eggs, at it, as it's happened in different other cuckoos. But in this case, the parent stays till the month of October. So after that, it started moving uh, southward. The next, it follows the, uh, it crosses the Arabian Sea rather than the Arabian Peninsula, which would have been a much shorter route to Africa. Next, it stays in the coastal region for at least a month. And probably it waits for a favorable wind to cross the sea. Most studies are required to see the dynamics of the distribution. We studied only in the part in Dehradun, and more studies can be carried out in different parts of India to see how the bird is migrating from those parts. Uh, I would like to thank uh, DBT for funding our study, and uh, this was a part of the 
our Indian Biosis Information Project uh, from IRS. Thanks to the symposium to give, a, to give us the opportunity to present our study. And thank you for listening. Fantastic, Demanjan. That was a very insightful like, idea about the rainbow because when I joined as a master's student at Wildlife Institute of India, our course director, Dr. Suresh Kumar, welcomed us saying that you guys should get your umbrellas because I dare to like understanding its movement has been fascinating. There are a few questions popping up in the chat box. We are short on time though. Okay, so Nishant has popped up with the first question. Where do these birds breed generally? Uh, so Nishant, can you repeat the question again? I, mean, there's, I think there's some technical glitch I'm able to hear it probably. So Nishant wants to understand where do these birds breed? So he wants to know their like breeding ranges. Uh, where do the birds come from? I couldn't hear it. Breed, breed. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, they have, they breed here in India only. Uh, they have breeding site in northern India and uh, the southern India population is resident. So uh, India is the breeding site actually. Okay. Charu Sharma has put in that there can be varied dynamics and data for this bird, right? As I have like spotted them in central India during his field work. Uh, yes, they're uh, they're actually their distribution is quite dry dynamic given their movement. So, uh, uh, where are these questions actually? Uh, is it in Discord server? So, Discord is the platform where people are putting questions, and we will be happy okay. for you to answer that. Okay, okay. I'll just continue the... asking questions to Debanjan while we thank him for doing this wonderful presentation. He will be available for like more deliberations over to Nikita for the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Dibanjan. That was a wonderful talk. Our next speaker is uh, Urvi Gupta. Urvi completed her master's in biodiversity conservation and management from Oxford University. Previously, she has worked in the All India Tiger Monitoring Project and currently as a project biologist, she works with the Black Kite team in association with the Wildlife Institute of India. The title of her talk is Black Kites and their relationships with anthropogenic resources. Thank you. Hello everyone. Um, I'm sure everyone here is familiar with the Black Kite, which is very common in our Indian cities. Today, I'm going to speak about uh, how telemetry has kept us fascinated about these birds even after 10 years of continuously monitoring them. Now, black kites are distributed uh, throughout the old world and are amongst the most common raptors uh, around the world. Their distribution overlaps with that of the steppe eagle, Asian brawny eagle, Palacis fish, fish eagle, and several other endangered raptors, which are difficult to study. Thus, making black kites a good model to uh, study movement ecology and the conservation requirement of other factors. Now, India, uh, and specifically Delhi, which is our study system, first two uh, subspecies of black kites. The resident Milbus mitchens govinda, which is the small Indian kite, and the migratory Milbus mitchens limiatis. Now, both of them can be quite difficult to distinguish. Uh, but there are some features that help us. Uh, the Lineatis weighs roughly twice the weight of uh, the Gobinda bird, has a lighter sear and tarsi coloration, longer feathers at near the tarsi, and a white carpal and uh, a white carpal patch in the, on its underwing. However, both of them being subspecies have a lot of overlaps on their morphology. Uh, while uh, we attempt to tag them, we ensure that the tag and the Teflon weight stays less than 3% of the world's body weight. And during the uh, tagging exercise, we ensure to take basic morphometric measurements, genetic samples, and blood smears to study their disease at a later point. Uh, trapping them is a different volume. 
birds. So for the migratory birds, we use a carpet of noses on the food subsidies at the slaughterhouse facilities because uh, we observe them uh, in high congregation at these sites uh, where they sit down and feed. However, uh, the, the resident Govinda birds are uh, lighter in weight, more acrobatic, and are habituated to the uh, philanthropic meat tossing exercise done by the Muslim community in Delhi. So we do something similar that we toss meat around the misnet and wait for the birds to get uh, trapped in it. However, if we have to capture a resident breeder, uh, things change and we have to put a smaller carpet of noses on the nest during its incubation period specifically. So this is a photo from 2014 when we tagged our first bird and got to learn about the fascinating movement ecology of uh, these birds and how they utilize our cities. So uh, over the last few years, we've been able to tag some 20 birds. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, the data set of 19 birds uh, that we followed. And we, see, we can see that their summer breeding ground is 85 times larger than their wintering ground, thanks to the food subsidies that India has to offer, that we limit, uh, we've limited their uh, resource requirement, movement requirement in, the, in this area. Saying this, I still believe that this is a very small sample size that we've tagged because these birds are present all over India and there are different strategies that they be using. We've uh, seen that these birds have a uh, higher speed while moving towards the breeding ground uh, and they cover a distance about 4,000 kilometers in about three weeks. Uh, their speed is faster while going towards their migratory grounds in Central Asia because uh, the adults have to secure a breeding space. And it's very interesting to see that these birds can fly as high as the K2 range. The eBird also corroborates with the data. Uh, we can see that during the summer months, there are observations in the Central Asian steps and during the winters uh, most of the observations are in South Asia. We've recently published this work in the journal scientific reports if you would like to uh, read this paper in greater detail. And what we've done is added our uh, uh, data set to the already existing pathways of the Central Asian flyway which are used by other birds. Now, I'd like you to uh, recall that image of the chicken slaughterhouse facility where we're trapping kites. So, as I said before, that black kites, black eared kites uh, congregate a lot on these landfill sites and uh, our chicken mandis at Ghazipur. Now, we know that Central Asia is the hub of bird flu, and when India faces it, we call a lot of poultry and a lot of waterfowl dies. But what is the role of raptors, if any, is virtually unknown, and we hope to uncover the, this in the coming uh, few years. Apart from the black eared kite, we also focus on the resident birds, and we, uh, uh, along with camera trap and uh, telemetry studies, we've been able to uncover their. Uh, foraging ecology, although we barely scratched the surface. So uh, uh, we've only tagged a handful of birds, but we can see very predictable movements to their food sources where they get uh, food subsidies. And about 90% of their diet is uh, comprised of these food subsidies that they get from mosques. Uh, to uh, distinguish between the home ranges of the black eared kite and the black kite in Delhi, I have got these uh, uh, maps for you. Now, the red area comprises of 50% of the bird's movement. So, for the migratory bird, we can see that 50% is uh, at, at and around the landfill sites of Delhi and has got a fairly smaller home range. And uh, for the resident breeders, which were followed throughout the year 
within Delhi itself. Uh, the red parts again were the areas during its breeding season where it was nesting and where it was foraging. Uh, so very predictable movements and very restrictive movements during its breeding season. But outside of the breeding season, it had a larger home range. Uh, since tags are expensive and we've not been able to uh, use, we don't, we haven't had the opportunity to tag them in large numbers to justify the sample size. We also do wing tag, and uh, this has also given very interesting patterns. Uh, this is an individual that was wing tagged in Delhi Zoo uh, last year in October, uh, in April. And subsequently, in four months' time, it was recited in Jorvi Bikanev, which is some 450 kilometers. Uh, hopefully, tagging them in the future will uh, give us more details about the local dispersal of juveniles. Now, we do know that black kites are really high in number and they offer incredible scavenging ecosystem services. However, they do cause some conflict with the aviation industry. So 60%, uh, close to 60% of all the bird strikes that happen in the aviation industry are caused by black kites. And uh, Republic Day is a, call, is, uh, uh, is a day of concern for the Indian Air Forces. So this year, we analyzed the data for uh, both the subspecies for the month of January. And we plotted the risk map to show where is the maximum, at which heights are the maximum risks and at which heights uh, the risks are minimum so that uh, the Indian Air Force and uh, the pilots can prepare for any casual, uh, can be better prepared for their flight formations. Uh, uh, telemetry is a great tool not only to understand the movement pattern and ecology uh, for conservation purposes, but also to mitigate conflict based on their behavior. With this, I'd like to thank our project supervisors and our project team and the funding partners who very generously supported our study for the past 10 years. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Urbi. We have lots of questions for you, but I will take only a few. So starting with Suhail, who wants to understand about the map where you showed the wintering region and the summering region for the kites. Suhail wants clarity on like how the data, why, was it for like individual birds or did you compile the full data set for 19 birds you tagged? Uh, we compiled the data for 19 birds. Okay. So all of the data is there. You can like follow it up in detail about the rationality of compiling it together. Another question we have is about like question of like people want you to have like cameras like stationed on the birds. There are a few questions about why do these kites get attracted to runaway strips? So we will cover these questions in the panel discussion. So I will skip it. Para wants to understand your like schemes about like how do you screen the blood smears for parasites so maybe if we can quickly inform about like, our protocols like in like nascent stage so yeah so uh, once we have a bird in hand we uh, make a blood smear and we preserve it uh, and then stain it in GIMSA and then analyze it under the microscope at various degrees of magnification. Uh, we are still uh, doing the analysis, we're still screening it uh, and we are at very nascent stages and still learning. So after like at 10x, 20x and so on and so forth, there'll be, you know, and uh, multiple fields of the same slide. That's how we look at our bloods here. So there are other questions which we'll take as part of the panel discussion, some of which concern like the impacts of tags, wing tagging and putting transmitters in birds. So thank you, Urvi. We move on to the next speaker, over to Nikita. Thanks, Urvi. 
Uh, our next speaker for the day is Malia Sri Bhattacharya. She is a research fellow at the Wildlife Institute of India, where she works on the ecology and recovery of the critically endangered vultures of Kangra, Himachal Pradesh. Previously, she has volunteered with uh, NCF in their Hornbill telemetry project. She has studied habitat use of the black-necked crane and has recently been involved in a study on the responses of birds and mammals to wind farms. The title of her talk is Telemetric Studies on the White Rumped Vulture. On to you, uh, Malia Sri. Hello, everyone. My name is Malia Sri Bhattacharya and I'm working as a junior research fellow with Wildlife Institute of India. My work is in Kangra district, Himachal Pradesh, and I wanted to understand the movement dynamics of wild white of vultures from Kangra. The vultures are nature's most useful scavengers. They can actually use full as a natural source for carcass disposal. They can clean up carcass within one hour rather than the other scavengers, which will take days and will spread difficult diseases like rabies tuberculosis. But in my field, what I have seen that uh, these vultures this is a group of wild white rum vultures and Himalayan driffen vultures too that have cleaned up the carcass within 20 minutes. Only bones were remaining. So uh, historically, there were a lot of vultures were found. More than thousands of vultures were found. But suddenly after 1990s, there was a rapid population decline following the use of diclofenac, a drug that was used to treat cattle. The drug was very dangerous to vultures as it can cause kidney failure and death for all the vultures. There are nine species of vultures in India and out of nine, four are critically endangered, one endangered at three near threatened. Among them, white rum vulture population has failed drastically, that is around 99%, following slender bill population failed around 97% and Eurasian griffon vulture failed slightly declined because it is wintering in India. The vulture was dying due to the use of veterinary drug diclofenac that was used to treat cattle. And uh, not only this diclofenac, there are other drugs too that has been equally toxic to vultures. The diclofenac was banned in 2006, but acyclofenac, nimesulite, and ketoproven is still used in veterinary practices that is equally toxic to vultures. Not only that, there is a major habitation loss that has happened for vultures. White rum vultures, the study species, is one of the old world vultures that is native to South and Southeast Asia. Once most abundantly found in India, this is now the population has gone to critically endangered since 2000. And it is only a solitary egg giving species that gives only a single egg and it is colonial nesting and its season starts from October following April even till May. It actually locates carrion by thermal soaring. It uses the thermal gardens and sky to actually locate the carcasses. They have a strong sense of eyesight that they can see far above from where the carrion is. My study area in Kangra district is full of cheer pine forest and uh, it is in the backdrop of the other ranges and uh, the vultures, I will understand the movement dynamics of the white rum vultures in wild. My study is to understand the movement dynamics and I have used a 55 gram EOPS GPS GSM tag. The trapping exercise was done following taking measurements, deploying the tag on bird, rechecking health and ensuring fitting of the tag and release of wild vultures in, within 20 minutes. So actually there are di different available natural feeding stations that are naturally available in wild. So these natural feeding stations are those stations that are used by locals to dispose the cows. And after the disposal of the cows, after the vultures have eaten, the bones and the skins went to industry and they sold this. So these feeding stations are very much important for these vultures to survive in those areas. So first, we will start by nose trapping exercise. So this nose trapping exercise is uh, done 
in those feeding station areas only and we will skin the cow and we used to wait there for 7 to 8 hours so the vultures will come and trap in those new traps following this after one month we have found our first vulture and we have uh, taken it to the nearest tent area where we have taken its measurements and then we have tagged it uh, along to thoracic extra harness according to anderson et al also we have checked the vulture for its fitness and how it can fly properly or not and we have also ringed it <clears throat> finally it was released in the wild and it was only within 25 minutes that we have done all the trapping thing and we have released the vulture in the wild the releasing was done with care of two local assistants along with a field assistant that is from forest department the highlights are this five wild wild ram vultures are moving every day from their roosting sites to their natural feeding sites and mostly they will go from around morning 8 o'clock to their roosting sites to the feeding sites and they again come back every day by 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock to their nesting sites or roosting sites this is the uh, tracking data of one individual that is showing movement in and around kangra district but it has moved around j and k till j and k and not more than that so uh, this is the movement that data from february to this month in, uh, from the december month to february and it is showing considerable movements in and around kangra district as well as in hamirpur district and jnk the distance moved from for each vulture we have seen that the one sub adult has moved the far that is up to jammu and kashmir but other vultures are moving in and around kangra district only from the tag data we have also understood and found many tracking data we have understood that there are many feeding stations that are actually left in wild that are not in official records and these feeding stations are very much important for this vultures to survive because uh, there are only four supplementary feeding stations available in kangra district by forest department but these natural feeding stations that are managed by locals and those butchers in the community those areas where they are selling bones and skins these areas our vultures are going and we have found it from our tagged vultures only another thing also we have found that our tagged vulture has nesting has started nesting and two of our tagged vulture among three have uh, nested successfully this year not only success stories there are threats also related to the vultures the threats to vulture population in kangra is that uh, there is a continuous power line mortality and you can understand this power lines are all nearby to the feeding stations in the locality and these feeding stations are imposing a lot of risk to this birds we are continuously working with the department to remove this power lines from the area but this feeding stations cannot be changed because the locals have usually designated those particular feeding station from far from the villages so that the smells will not go or any other kind of thing will not go outside so this feeding stations are actually <clears throat> threat to the power line areas which is a concern of risk another thing also related to this is decrease of open carcass disposal mostly nowadays people are burying their carcasses because one is carrying charges of the carrion that they used to give it to the person who will carry the carcass to the particular feeding station and another thing is the decrease of this open bone industry and skin industry so the people are usually changing their jobs from doing this type of work than the other works and they are burying the carcasses so this imposes a great risk for the vultures because food availability is a major thing that is uh, actually important for the white rum vultures other than that there are threat to nesting trees also there are forest fires by local for growth of grasses and raising collection that poses serious threats to nesting trees 
only during the breeding season if we can stop the resin collection then that that will be a, also a very important task this uh, tree in left as you can see is a uh, uh, impact of forest fire and the nest was above so <clears throat> this imposes serious risk to the birds and another just a new story that i wanted to share is that this vultures uh, are pair monogamous pairs that we all know they are monogamous pairs that are uh, having single pairs in the wild so this left one was our tagged vulture and it was not moving from that particular branch it was very ill and we were tracking it for 7 8 days and it was not moving from that particular tree branch so suddenly after 5 days what we have seen that another vulture came and it was continuously feeding that particular vulture so that vulture finally regained its energy and it flown back to its nesting site so it was a success story for this uh, tagged vulture and uh, at the last i will thank all of my team without whom i can't think of tagging my bird and to my supervisor dr gautam talukdar to providing support and i will thank ministry of environment and forest change for funding my study thank you everyone for all your support and guidance thank you at the last i will thank all of my team without whom i can't think of tagging mm. my word mm. and to my supervisor dr gautam talukdar to providing support and i will thank ministry of environment and forest change for funding my study Thank you, everyone, for all your support and guidance. Fantastic, Malishri. I guess on Discord, people are responding the quality of the effort you guys have put on field. It has given critical insights into the ecology of vultures. It is sad that despite having forty million individuals in in various vulture species, we have less than two or three percent available. so few of the quick questions for you are uh, uh, from suhail uh, like he wants to understand and he complements that it is amazing to know that one vulture was feeding the another he wants to you to clarify if both of them were adults we can't hear you will you please switch on your mic thanks yes hello so both of them were adults only one sub adult we have tagged so that both of them were adults only great so it would be good to like check their samples like whenever you can in the lab definitely you have a lot of best wishes boss from all of us thank you bye bye thank you sir over to niketa now thanks malia sri Uh, our next speaker for the day, our final speaker as well, is Varun Kher. Uh, he completed his masters in wildlife science from the Wildlife Institute of India. He has previously worked in semi-arid and arid grassland habitats to study various amphibians and avifauna. The title of his talk is "Conservation of the Great Indian Bustard Using Telemetry." Over on to you, Varun. Thank you. Hello everyone. I am Varun from Wildlife Institute of India's Bustard Recovery Program, and today I will be talking about how telemetry has helped us in conservation of the Great Indian Bustard in the Thar landscape. As most of you are well aware, the Great Indian Bustard is amongst the most threatened bird species in the world and has declined precipitously in the last many years. It was once widespread throughout India's semi-arid countryside, but is now restricted to arid areas of Rajasthan, Gujarat, Karnataka, and Maharashtra. its largest viable population of around 100 to 150 birds currently resides in the jaisalmer district of rajasthan and i'll be talking about some of the tag birds that are giving us crucial insights to conservation of this population uh the historical decline of the species can be mainly attributed to human induced mortality of adult birds first due to hunting and now due to collision with power lines uh it is estimated that around 10 to 15 great indian bustards die each year due to collision with power lines and this is a big number for any species particularly a critically endangered one uh at the same time gib habitats that is open grasslands and savannas are declining rapidly mainly due to conversion to industrial and agricultural land uses fueled by the colonial policy of identifying these areas as wastelands uh 
the entire thing is made worse by the biological handicap of life history that the bustards are blessed with. Bustards are poor breeders and recruitment in the wild is generally low. Thus, the stability of the population is contingent on survival of adult birds and human-induced adult mortality can have a severe impact on their population persistence. To illustrate, look at the example here. Given no human-induced deaths, the population is expected to be stable. But just two human-induced deaths every year can lead to a big population decline. Uh, given all these challenges, a Buster Task Force was set up in 2010 and its recommendations were widely adopted as Buster Recovery Plans. Uh, but implementing these recommendations, particularly these three, required greater knowledge of the species, which could only be gathered through application of wildlife telemetry. Thus, the Wildlife Institute of India uh, started tagging Great Indian Bustards from 2014. Between 2014 and 2019, uh, Three birds were tagged in Gujarat and Maharashtra by Dr. Jala, Dr. Datta and Dr. Bilal respectively. Uh, but these populations had by then reduced to very low numbers and it was essentially to study the largest population that was left in Rajasthan. Thus, a telemetry program for the population in Thar was started in 2019 and subsequently seven birds were, were tagged, five in the Desert National Park Wildlife Sanctuary and two in, in the areas around Pokhran. These birds were caught using customized new straps and then fitted with, uh, with GPS, GSM backpack uh, transmitters using elastic harnesses. The weight of the tag was around 50 grams, which is less than 1% of the body weight of the species. Uh, apart from the remote data that the tags were continuously collecting, we did a lot of follow-up surveys and ground tracking of the birds to, uh, to understand various aspects of behavior and life history. Uh, Additionally, uh, points used by the birds were sampled for vegetation, vegetation and insects. This uh, gave us a holistic understanding on the species of the species and on some important demographic parameters that were of interest, uh, interest for conservation management. So coming to how this helped in, the, in planning conservation for the species, let's look at what we knew before starting the telemetry program. Uh, First, we knew that the bird is found in two clusters. Left To the left is the Desert National Park Wildlife Sanctuary and to the right is the broad Pokhran area. Uh, we also knew from the tag birds in Gujarat and Maharashtra that bustards are very large ranging species and can cover the distance between these two areas very easily. We also knew that they need inviolate grasslands for breeding uh, but can use the overall agro-pastoral countryside during the non-breeding season. Uh, in Rajasthan, it was known that the birds disperse, but where do they go was something of a mystery. Uh, there were even suggestions by many scientists working in the landscape that the birds migrate to Pakistan where they are hunted in large numbers and that contributes to the decline of the species. Uh, well, telemetry was the best solution to answer some of these questions and what we found is presented here. Uh, so we uh, could kind of ratify that the bird is indeed very wide ranging and has home ranges quite an excess of 100 square kilometers, which, which is quite large for, for a bird. Uh, we also saw that while it is using these enclosures or uh, inviolate grasslands maintained by the forest department, it is also using some areas, agro-pastoral areas beyond these enclosures. Uh, looking deeper at the data, we found that the space use of the bird uh, is very different in the breeding season as compared to the non-breeding season. In the breeding season, it is restricted to these old growth grasslands managed by the forest department. While in the non-breeding season, it uses the entire landscape uh, quite widely and even the non-protected areas surrounding these enclosures. Uh, we could uh, again uh, confirm that these breeding areas are indeed very critical for persistence of population and mainly for breeding of the species. Uh, we also saw that some newly created recovery, uh, some new vegetation recovery through these enclosures was also helping the species as some of these new enclosures are also used quite, quite heavily by our tag birds. Uh, let me illustrate all these points using this animation. To the left is uh, is movement data from the breeding season and to the right is the data from the non-breeding season. Uh, 
So uh, this is end of July, start of August. As the breeding season is setting in, you can see that the birds are slowly restricting themselves to these enclosure patches, mainly the old grassland, old growth grassland area in the middle that is called Sudashil. You can see that the activity during the core breeding season was entirely restricted to this area and as the breeding season wore off, the birds moved out. Now, let's look at what happens during the non-breeding season. Uh, this starts roughly in November and goes on till February. And as you can see, the birds are moving uh, in the entire landscape and even outside the enclosures. So broadly, we can summarize that during the breeding season, the birds use these protected areas very intensively and during the non-breeding season, they move out and use the entire agro-pastoral landscape. Uh, similarly, uh, we didn't know much about the breeding biology of the species before the telemetry exercise was started. The earlier assumption was that females lay only one egg in a season and rarely nest again if a clutch is unsuccessful. This also sparked very genuine fears that the conservation breeding program that was started for the species will drive the bird to extinction in the wild. But we found that while most other information like incubation period, parental care and breeding season was uh, found through telemetry was congruent with direct observations, the part about fecundity wasn't. Our tag bird showed that females nest almost certainly and can lay up to five clutches if the preceding ones are unsuccessful. Uh, on the same lines, we saw that some of our tag birds whose uh, eggs were collected for the captive breeding program relayed in the wild and successfully raised their chicks. For example, this is our tag bird 5949 whose first egg in the season was, was collected, named Corona in captivity because it was born during the first lockdown. And the bird relayed and then successfully raised the female chick in the wild. Uh, coming to demographics, our dummy experiments and direct observations had shown that nest predation in GIV breeding areas is remarkably high and chick survival uh, is also, was also expected to be very low given the erratic distribution of resources in this landscape. Uh, this, we thought, would lead to a very low recruitment rate in the wild. Uh, however, our telemetry studies gave us a much more nuanced perspective. First, as mentioned uh, earlier, we found that the probability of a female nesting is very high, almost 100%. Uh, let's, for the sake of explanation, consider that this square is an egg laid by a female and each of these squares represents a 1% probability of a particular thing happening to the egg. Uh, these are 100 squares in, in this box. Uh, we found that not all mustard eggs are fertile and about 40% of them are infertile. Thus, any given, for any given egg, there is only 60% chance that it is fertile. Uh, on top of that, nest predation was estimated at 50%. Um, so essentially, only 5 out of 10 eggs laid every year uh, will, will survive. Uh, thus, taking both fertility and hatching success together, uh, the probability of a wild egg hatching is quite low, around 25%. Uh, but this is offset by the high probability of a female re-nesting. Uh, thus, if you look at these squares, these squares will add up given that the bird is re-nesting and you have a fair probability of a wild egg hatching. But, uh, but this the situation is complicated by the rainfall in this landscape, which is quite erratic. We found that in good rainfall years, the birds re-nested up to four or five times, but during bad rainfall, the re uh, the degree of re-nesting reduced drastically. Similarly, the probability of chick survival was dependent on rainfall and was much lower during the bad rainfall years. Cumulatively, the recruitment in the wild was seen to range from very low to very high depending on the rainfall in, in that year. Apart from uh, understanding ecology of the species, uh, the telemetry data has also helped us in identifying and mitigating threats. Two of the three birds that were tagged in Gujarat and Maharashtra died due to pollen collisions and uh, showed us the magnitude of this threat. Our tag birds in Jaisalmer frequently cross power lines and are under a constant threat of collisions. Uh, data from the telemetry exercise helped us refine and validate uh, areas marked for power line mitigation. 
and the matter is currently in the supreme court uh, under a case uh, regarding poll and mitigation uh, and the way forward we currently use the telemetry data as a feedback loop for uh, for our conservation decisions we hope to expand the scope of this tool further by tagging more birds mainly males and birds from other areas mainly pokhran and the area surrounding it we plan to integrate data from other sensors with the gps data that we get through our tags we plan to use accelerometers and weather stations to correlate gps data with them uh, we also hope to look at behavioral and decision making related questions uh, in the species a uh, habitat use study is currently ongoing and and most of the monitoring that i spoke about in this talk is expected to continue in the long run as i mentioned earlier uh my presentation today was on behalf of the entire field team of wis bus recovery program the team is led by dr datta uh, who is a faculty at the wildlife institute and mentored by dr jhala in from wi uh dr tushna dr uh, mr bin and dr rathod keep our field efforts together with with their experience and my colleagues mohit dev saurav vishal indro and myself we are all involved in the ground implementation of most of the project activities uh i thank all of you for hearing me out patiently and the stage is open for questions thank you thank you all for hearing me out patiently and the stage is open for questions thank you wonderful varun good to see you and like although like we are discussing about probably the most endangered bird on definitely in this part of the world we are happy that like we have like some positives and we have like clear indicators into like what might work for busters and like with a clear visual representation about which you already have answered few questions so suhail and few colleagues were asking about whether you clump the data in your animations and you answered that yeah monica koshik wants to understand you only tag females or do you have males or do you expect males to be around as well uh, so the patterns that are showed in the present presentation are based on our tag females but the direct observations on males kind of support the same same inferences but we are hoping to tag males in the upcoming years and hopefully we'll have some more robust insights coming soon great bara wants to understand about their foraging ecology in the breeding season and how does it vary across seasons uh right the movement uh, patterns and uh, and the heat maps that i showed were esen essentially included uh, the movement for foraging rather most of the movement that was happening was for foraging and and not otherwise so if i'll add and enhance the question will it be like something that they get more protective for the areas and they select a different area when they breed right no. uh we think so we think there are two things playing out one is these birds probably have site fidelity the birds that we have tagged have re-nested at the same place multiple times at the same time these breeding enclosures that i showed uh, uh prima facie have lot more arthropod biomass than the area outside during the monsoons when there are crops in the agri agricultural fields surrounding these areas these are the resource rich areas uh, in the entire landscape Uh, a habitat study is continue is currently ongoing, and my colleague Indranil, who works on it, will at some point give tell us more about it. Suhail so wants to just check about the sample size you use to build the demographic probabilities in the beginning of the presentation. Was it right? This is based on this is based on seven birds, uh, seven tagged birds. But apart from that, we had monitored many other eggs from non non tag birds, and the results, the the probabilities were more or less similar. So it's a combination of seven tag birds and a lot of eggs monitored through direct observation, and seven birds in this case is around five to ten percent of the population. So it's it's a fair sample size, I believe. Thank you. I will take the last question in the interest of time while you can continue answering people on this call. Right. So Dr. Koshik wants to ask. what additional parameters are you going to obtain using the accelerometry data like how is an accelerometer going to help right we are uh, we are hoping to uh, calibrate the accelerometer data to find out the exact uh, to find out when the birds are foraging and and when they are just moving around between foraging so the main objective of that data is to 
to tease apart the data between movement and foraging. Okay. Fantastic, Varun. That was wonderful. I guess a lot of questions are going to pop up and we'll be very happy if you answer them. People can continue posting questions on Discord while we move to our next session, which is a panel discussion. Before we move into the panel discussion, I will answer a few questions, which I guess were repeated across different sessions, particularly regarding the ethics of why do we place tags and do we have like impacts on bird species or individuals while using tags or different ways to monitor. So while we have a lot of like seniors on the panel who can give their views while they do share it through next half an hour, I'll just say that the tag life question was asked multiple times. So a solar panel based tag lasts somewhere around two to three years, depending upon how the bird is able to expose it. So depending upon the feather structure, how well the bird like remains in the nest, who shares the like incubation duties and all. So depending upon these aspects, you would be able to understand the tag life. So that's where like my initial commentary came in that one should understand the basic ecology of the bird to begin tagging programs. Otherwise you might choose a tag which is not fit enough. If you have birds which are like nesting in holes or in burrows. So in such situations, you would likely use tags which are battery based and which are not dependent on solar charge. They should weigh less than 3% of the body weight is the standard ethical like protocol, which has been like achieved after like doing telemetry studies across the world by different groups. A major question which people asked was like whether these tags, even wing tags or even tassel tags, do these impact birds? A simple answer would be yes. Like birds would not like us to tag them. Like they were here, like and we have like kind of intruded the spaces where they were like like doing fine for thousands and millions of years altogether. But now that human actions are creating havoc on so many different species. They're also supporting many species like black kites, which are proliferating in numbers and their interactions with humans are creating situations of conflict. So in this whole paraphernalia, we need to take an ethical question, which will depend upon, not just upon species to species, but also on population. In terms of what do we wish to achieve by giving certain pain to a bird. So if you put less than 2% of body weight in terms of whatever tassel tags, wing tags, and like, like satellite tags are placed, it is much like how we get edgy about like wearing a new wristwatch. So if it is less than 3%, the bird should get easy about it. Nevertheless, every study should start with a bit of caution. You should like check with experts who have already done it, either from the same part of the world to start with or if there are no experts available for similar kind of species, I guess internet has allowed world to like get connected in better ways. So with this, we move into the panel discussion. Hello to all the panelists here on board. And we will be happy to get all sorts of questions. We already have a few questions for us where the panelists have been selected in specification to talk about this conservation and ecological aspects of bird tagging. Another set of questions would focus on applied ecological aspects. So somebody asked question about why do black kites rush towards airfields or like on the runway fields. The last but most important component, which somehow has come across quite repeatedly, would focus on doing some sort of citizen science and not just with discussions, but can we start something which can be integrated across the world. For that, we have like representatives from Central Zoo Authority and also representatives from Indian Forest Services. So under this purview, we will be discussing for about next 40 minutes or so, like 30 to 40 minutes. Okay, sorry. We lost a bit of time and we are sorry to lead organizers who have to do the post session after it. And we are very thankful to people who are with us even now. So to set the tone for panel discussion, it is very interesting. It was particularly interesting for me to see the connectivity patterns in which species have been responding to human disturbed habitats, also to like general environmental stochasticities. So if 
step eagles were like moving into the southern latitudes like this blackites were getting like plumbed onto like certain urban centers because of the human assistance and foraging or like availability of food subsidies so if and if we can integrate ourselves not just with single species but with multiple species across asia because i guess such kind of questions can only be answered if we integrate it across the northern and southern latitudes telemetry unfortunately has been a forte of like westernized cities and institutions so we need to like focus on migratory patterns and answer questions about tropical home or temperate home hypothesis to like contribute to conservation of certain species with tropical home or temperate home hypothesis i mean to say that there are few set of experts who think that birds originated in temperate regions and they move away towards tropical systems to avoid harsh winters and to like grab opportunities as opposed to that many people propound the idea of tropical home hypothesis wherein they try and avoid the competition in tropics by moving towards temperates and over the seasons hundreds and thousands and billions of years we have had this set of phenomena of course there are questions around like the genetics aspect of it we discussed the individual versatility and individual variability for many birds for birds which are resident breeders and of hasting conservation concern it is another discussion altogether in terms of how they socialize of course they socialize in an area where they like share those areas by another social animal which is us humans so this opens the pandora box of new era of ethnoornithology wherein we will use the telemetry studies to go deeper into these like ethnic relationships which many of these groups have like for instance aprajita datta's group they have been studying the relationship of like local communities with frugivorous birds and we have across the country like people who used to be dependent on vultures for certain parts of the certain aspects of their livelihoods we all were dependent on their scavenging services and of course we should not simply be like focused on services which have like clear like economic benefits but simply the relationship which we have shared with species altogether every household in india or the other if we talk to our elders they would have these like few anecdotes to share about how beautifully they connected with multiple bird species so my first question would start with the war horse of indian ornithology dr s pala chandran because he's the first name which comes in terms of monitoring birds talk of any activity so bala sahab like can you start sharing the like feelings about like restarting your research career altogether from 2010 onwards because in my limited understanding i guess the telemetry equipment like they took a boom specifically for birds after 2010 so if you can restart your research career what would be your like main targets so that would be quite beneficial for early career researchers like us thanks okay okay my uh, my association with the satellite tracking practice has been 2010 and uh, uh since i have been marking the birds for the last 40 years but it came as a boon to study because our our analysis are based on that what between two points ringing ringing site and the re, what recovery site and the hypothetical lines which is joining and how the bird must have. so people starting the satellite telemetry we know that one, okay that the birds Uh, based on their movement pattern, it was earlier considered the, for example, Pacific golden plover was the species which can undertake a non-stop flight of over four thousand miles. It was predicted based on their stopover sites between the distance between the closest stopover site, like while crossing the ocean. But uh, but now everybody knows from the internet. The, Kilometer. These all come to very handy to reveal so many facts and light and cover 
uh, Baradud, who was known to fly high, that uh, in the highest flying birds in the world. But that all because because of the uh, using the head to cross the Himalayas. So this kind of what startling information we can get it and how the uh, because since I have been doing uh, handling what uh, hundred thousands of birds even yesterday night also we can what can handle several birds for ringing and how that weight increase happening all those things which we have been recording through uh, this uh, handling for ringing but this kind of sat but i was dreaming to start, put transmitters on uh, this show birds which are the one undertaking the not, what what migration between the arctic to the southern uh, southern hemisphere tape so that uh, i have been uh, looking for that one because I am also satisfied with my own work and also by getting a lot of recoveries through the conventional method, the color flagging site. And since we, because we, we were not, we actually permission was not given to BNHS being a non-government organization to ha handle this uh, transmitter studies in India. That's what the study came to. And end in 2010, now recently, our colleagues have started putting some transmitters in Maharashtra on some short birds like black tail god we tell, Eurasian curlew, which we are expecting. That, that one, and uh, uh, that, uh, anyway, uh, what we feel is actually that uh, to ring what thousands of, uh, to get to one recapture or recovery, we have to capture more than thousands of thousands of sometimes five thousands of birds depending on monitor. More than fifty percent of birds could not be tracked beyond certain limit. So the, that time we realized that one. Now that after seeing some of the tracking studies even taken undertaken by our wildlife institute, uh, like that on our Jacobinus cuckoo, even the Amur falcon, they are also the recent technology also they could track. Uh, uh, Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. That that way now nowadays this the technology has also improved because uh, when we started first time in large scale in the 2007, but we have we faced a lot of uh, what uh, failure rather than the success. But as I mentioned in my studies, only three species we have successfully tracked and studied that one. Okay, that one and you know we have got a pros and cons on both the studies, the ringing studies we could but generate a lot of information on other thing because handle a lot of birds. That's the only thing. And uh, the other thing is also the constraint is also money involved. And here also more effort needed for uh, large scale ringing. And to, with the small, uh, what I, I have been toiled for so many years to uh, by ringing so many lakhs of birds to come to know about the at least migratory birds of some 60 species very well. But the satellite telemetry can add into more this one since I started from conventional ringing and shifted to telemetry and now I have stopped telemetry due to the uh, lack of permission that's a thing I learned it and really I am amazing to see that one this kind of study has been used for to study the home range and for uh, vultures and uh, bustard and even that uh, uh, what plaquage studies so with, with they have with the uh, specific purposes, but my aim was only to the uh, studying the long distance migratory birds like that. So any other question, uh, whether I answered to your question, Nishant, or I want to add more into that one. Yeah, we will have, we have like, definitely have. So I guess like you should start penning a book in terms of like how like we should remain humble with like both our efforts, like as new researchers, we tend to get motivated to put a lot of transmitters and we forget the values of traditional methods of putting a lot of ringing exercises into practice, which can then contribute to the overall benefit which we get from putting transmitters on birds. So we'll hope for a good popular book from you soon, Bala. 
So we move next to yeah. Dr. Sonali Ghosh. And Dr. Ghosh, we would like you to like reflect upon like how like the new age offices are reflecting on the utility of like telemetry studies. So of course, like because initially telemetry was quite expensive before 2010, and we could only do it either like in concerns like related to like bird flu or like various other like disease connotations. And also like probably for like critically endangered birds, but now with lesser cost and like better connectivity across the world, we can do it better. So can you represent like, like Indian Forest Services and share some opinions before we delve into deeper questions? Uh, thank you there, Dr. Nishant. Can you hear me? I can, yes. Okay. Uh, good, to, good to connect and good to see a lot of familiar uh, faces, of course. Uh, so, uh, very warm good afternoon from Guwahati uh, in Assam. And, uh, uh, and a good afternoon to all my panelists, fellow panelists, Dr. Balachandran, uh, Dr. Gauri, good to see you back here. I also see uh, Nita ma'am and Soumya there. So very nice. I'm so sorry, my apologies. Actually, honestly, Nishant, I have been trying very hard to connect on that Discord. And I think it was truly a Discord for me. I've not been able to, you know, since last one and a half hours, I've been trying, but I didn't want to disturb you all. It just kept asking me for if I'm human. And I was clicking on those buttons. But uh, so I think I've missed out most of it. But I hope since I've registered, I'll be able to see the recordings and do that. Is it okay to just present here? Yeah, Nishant? Links are there. Yeah. You can. Okay. You can. can. Yeah. Can you see this? Yes. You can. Okay. Uh, I hope you can see my uh, slides now. Will you put it on like full yeah. speed mode? It will be better for us. Yeah. yeah. Are you able to see it? Because I, I have put it on full mode, full screen mode. I can't no? see it. Can someone else confirm? Uh, it's not yet. It's not, not in yet? full screen yet. Not yet full screen yet, but you can see the slides, right? Yes, yes ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think, uh, let me just try again, but, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I hope it's visible, uh, and I'll try to make it full screen. I just hope, uh, Gauri, can you see it? Even if you can see we, a little bit of it. We can see but it's not full screen, but I okay. think that's okay. That's okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much there. And Dr. Nishant, I think, um, thank you for, you know, making me part of this. It is really amazing. Uh, I was listening. I mean, I was kind of, you know, looking through the, going through the sessions. And as you said that how we can integrate this into our, uh, a forest department. So, uh, of course, I mean, if you you are able to see this beautiful picture of you, Urvi, and a lot of others when we celebrated the Kindness uh, Matters Day, World Kindness Day in uh, Delhi Zoo, and you know, it, this is how where your work, especially the one which you are doing on uh, tagging the black kites, was of so much of an enthusiasm. Uh, to the kids uh, in, in, you know, the local kids who had come in. And it was wonderful uh, that how we were able to actually communicate science and, and make them connect uh, to the conservation. So to me, that kind of sums up uh, what, uh, you know, we can do in terms of using science and then, uh, uh, you know, uh, doing a conservation outreach. So this topic is very, very new for me. And uh, I think uh, the most, uh, that's why for me, it was like, I just did a Google Scholar search and it was fascinating to understand that you have several, uh, you know, different types of inferences, conservation inferences based on telemetry studies. So for example, uh, a very critical element of the Central Asian flyway has been uh, the tagging of the birds, I mean, uh, you know, and we now know that how we should be able to tag the birds and we should be able to get the information. Uh, we have, of course, uh, got uh, this very interesting paper, which I came through, which is basically bird conservation from obscurity to popularity, the study of two bird species from Northeast India. Uh, 
Uh, it talks about the Amur Falcon and the Bugun Leochikla. And of course, Amur Falcon, as we know, uh, was studied very well in terms of, uh, you know, its migratory patterns and then why there was a need to conserve its uh, stopover site. Of course, uh, our own work uh, when we are looking at Assam and with BNHS on the Bengal Floritan. And uh, very recently, and this was interesting and perhaps Dr. Gauri can also throw some light on this, is basically looking at birds and looking at how disease uh, is spreading across uh, different continents. So that I thought was very interesting. And uh, this is what, because until recently, until December, I was with Central Zoo Authority. And uh, I, I feel personally that there is this fascinating aspect of looking at urban ecology, looking at uh, zoos, and looking at conservation uh, through uh, you know, science-based monitoring, and it includes, of course, uh, bird monitoring. And uh, of course, uh, the recent example, which I was quoting about, about uh, was of Dr. Nishan's own work, uh, where it was so fascinating to understand that how in Delhi Zoo, uh, we have not one, but two species of black kites coming all the way from Mongolia and other places, and what kind of a urban conservation linkage it had. So, so we have around 150 zoos across the country and uh, they are, uh, you know, ideal sites uh, to take up some sort of a uh, monitoring or some sort of a systematic work, which will not just help us understand urban environments, but also help in conservation uh, outreach. So, uh, yeah, so primarily a few points from my side is that, you know, as, as a country, we have really opened up to uh, new technology. Uh, very recently, I think last year, we had the new drone policy and a lot of things have actually opened up. So it's less of red tape and more of uh, embracing new technology. And I think here, youngsters like you all must come up with what are the challenges to procure, let's say a small, you know, a transmitter or a, or a you know, a kind of an equipment. What are the challenges and why? and what should be done to ease out uh, uh, the business in, in, in procuring the same. Uh, my second question would be, uh, yes, can we make such equipment in India? Perhaps we might. Uh, and then, of course, we have this whole set of, you know, plethora of uh, species and, and sites that we can look through zoos. Hello, everyone. And definitely there is a need to include uh, the way we do bird monitoring as part of our multilateral environment agreements. So, so let's say a Ramsar wetland, right? So if there is a wetland management plan, which is uh, kind of mandated under the uh, Ramsar convention, there is a time or there might be a need now to include a certain aspect on, on, on uh, you know, preferential monitoring using uh, uh, tagging and, and so on. So, so it could be inbuilt into the way we look at uh, our uh, sites, protected sites under these environmental agreements. Uh, Central Asian Flyway, for example, for sure, uh, needs to be strengthened uh, using, uh, you know, such telemetry studies. Uh, even at the national level, if you're looking at the National Wildlife Action Plan, or even the management plan of protected areas. So if there are specifically certain protected areas with you know, a bird, uh, which is kind of uh, uh, a focus area, then we might want to actually include certain sections. Currently, they are, you know, the, they are a bit, uh, let's say, you know, silent on this, that whether we can leverage technology into studying these uh, 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 species. Like for example, when we talk about tiger reserves, we know that there is a set pattern of uh, using all India tiger monitoring estimation exercise, which is a four year cycle. And you know, there has to be a camera trap mark recapture technology. So similarly, when we are looking at our bird species or any other endangered species, I think uh, uh, monitoring and uh, should be integral to the way we, uh, we study these uh, uh, species. And of course, uh, as you know, very important capacity building across verticals, uh, because as I said, for me, this is, uh, it was a new sector. I'm not sure how many, I mean, youngsters, certainly young officers are very good in terms of, you know, uh, the technology with drones and others, but uh, telemetry is still limited 
to research field. It is still limited to uh, scientists. And there might be a need to you know, build capacities across uh, the department to handhold on this. So uh, thank you so much. And I will uh, stop here. Sorry, I think I, PPT was not moving. I'm so sorry. Um, I, I don't know what to do, Nishan, but uh, yeah. I, I think try I and integrate yeah. it like post hoc if we can like request right. our like tech gurus to like conjoin the uh, video with that aspect. So like thanks, Dr. Ghosh. And before we move on to like Dr. Neeta Shah and Dr. Somya Prasad, I would like to continue on the note where Dr. Ghosh left, wherein like zoos happen to be a good resource in terms of where like citizen science can actually be executed. There are like fantastic work which is happening both from the end of Bombay Natural History Society for a long time. NCF, like citizen science leg has like done tremendous work and they're reaching through multiple institutions. And that's where like, because we took a lead organization on this, I thought to like discuss that point with Central Zoo Authority itself that can telemetry exercises integrated across 150 zoos, which Dr. Ghosh just discussed, be the first practical leg into like letting people understand that we have certain gadgets like this. So people appreciate, we get higher flow of researchers, volunteers, and as I can see on Discord, Praveen has just commented, and of course, because before he became a bird enthusiast, he was also, like, he is an engineer by training. So he is putting forth ideas of like connecting or like developing networks of Indian institutions devoted to technology. So when we form the best minds, as they say, for the world, why can't we invest ourselves into bird research? It is not like rocket science, as they say, it needs certain platforms just to charge the tag itself. So Praveen, yes, we have heard you and we'll get back to you. Like the research group, which is like leading various perspectives in Wildlife Institute of India would be sure to like reach out to Roorkee, which is just in the vicinity and we'll get back. So Dr. Gauri, are you there? Yes. Yes. So we would like to understand the feasibility of like doing it first on a like pilot basis for like few of the national, uh, the only national zoo we have in Delhi and how, how easy would it be to like gather funds for putting basic one or two transmitters and like how can like somebody like ex execute something like this, like probably the citizen science arm of NCF, if they wish to do it, like can we do an integration of CZS vision for like citizen science? Thanks. Uh, Nishan, thank you for the opportunity. And it's really nice to see everybody here. Sonali, ma'am, nice to connect with you after a long time. Uh, Doc, nice to see you, Soumya. Uh, everyone here, thank you for being here. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming your question is related to citizen science from the education perspective, right? Uh, Nishan, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. It will definitely create a lot of scientific data as well. But yes. I see the larger vision in like using zoos as centers, which will be accessible for people. Like if NCF's like citizen science leg starts, it generally tries to feed on already developed cultures. So I was thinking if we can like develop a culture among people who are already visiting zoos. So we have a lot of motivation in people for like non-human flora and fauna. So, oh, okay. So I'll just say that uh, zoos across India, we have over a hundred zoos across the country, um, more than 150 actually. And uh, uh, so it's, it's a great setting with captive audiences. Uh, so we have a large number of people visiting zoos. We have more than 80 million a year that visit zoos across the world. And um, certainly data from citizen science, when you're talking about different species, migratory movements, uh, surveillance plans, whatever you have, if we are able to bring it uh, into our information and display systems, all zoos have information centers, interpretation centers, if you are able to bring this information and display it to people, if you are able to show real-time 
uh, how telemetry is working and you know the the implications the ecological implications and the solutions that it's bringing about i'm sure it will make a lot of difference and then bringing on people encouraging them to be part of your data collection exercises or whichever way you want them to be involved as citizen scientists i'm certain that uh, it it will definitely be okay to start with zoos from the interpretation education perspective thank you so like we should take confidence if we like start something from the end of probably from the education perspective if you are able to share data and you know come up with a way that you can put up um, information signages or whatever how are you going to integrate that with the zoo it's something that you will have to do it, it's not taking a bird from the zoo and releasing it there it's about all the the data that you already have the work that you're already doing how are you going to showcase it to the people that are visiting the zoo because you have a captive audience here okay so yeah certainly i mean if if there are if there is a way to inform about this i think it will be a good thing so can like central zoo authority also help us in regulating funds because like thankfully for like, i don't think this uh, is a platform to discuss funding so let's do that when there is a uh, you know the idea is here so if there is a specific project that comes about i'm certain that we can talk about it and see where we go with it but uh, the the first thing would be to come up with a plan to say how is this going to work we have the captive audience here so how is how, how is in science going to be uh, you know benefit how how is uh, the monitoring program how citizen science is going to be able to help with that I, i mean that's something that we need to come up with first sure thank you gauri welcome so, yeah before i move on to somya uh, who will like talk about like multiple utilities of these transmitters themselves because chris powden has commented that instead of just focusing on home ranges and movement tags are also a wonderful tool to understand the survivorship of certain organisms specifically for the ones which are which are critically endangered for which we might say that like only like character x or like pre, uh, predator x is causing the mortality so telemetry can open new ways of like envisioning how simple threats get perpetuated because of anthropogenic actions and in similar fashion so before i discuss that with somya i would like to discuss with neeta ma'am her experiences recent experiences of like enthusiasm from bihar forest department so bihar and like likewise eastern up and like adjoining like states like west bengal and orissa we have not had a good protocol for monitoring the bird fauna in that part of the world so neeta ma'am can you like briefly share your like exhilarating success in terms of having a, Uh, an outstanding support from the forest department and quick vision about how it is going to materialize uh thank you nishant and namaskar everybody i really appreciate the organized effort organizers efforts for having um uh, set this program for bird monitoring i think it's a very important uh, um uh, topic uh, and a hot topic i would say because it is uh, it it has got a lot of uh, it's got a large crowd it's got many takers it's got many scientific contributors into this um, in this arena and um, of course the species are numerous for a nation like ours so over 1300 and um, with this uh, i would like to thank nishan for having me on board appreciate the same and namaskar to all my panelists friends vanakam bala I I I'm really thrilled to be a part of this uh, uh panel program. Well, uh, having said this, uh, I'm very very excited to be associated with the Bihar program for uh monitoring ringing of birds uh, uh especially under the Central Asian Flyway and uh, I'm really thrilled uh, to um uh, to observe that the government of Bihar, the Department of Environment Forests climate change have been um, really forthcoming and positive when the government machinery are with there with you for research uh, and for actions for conservation i think sky is the limit then 
but we need to have the best of opportunities and the team to take these things forward more positively. Um, uh, with this, I would like to share that um, we were, we, uh, with the support of the government uh, uh, of Bihar, we were able to do uh, probably the first for the state of Bihar, the annual waterfall counts uh, this year. And uh, it was engaging all the bird intelligentsia, the birders of the local, uh, the local birders of Bihar to be a part of it. So it was a very um, uh, citizen science-like approach and uh, a very positive outcome. And I think it has set a baseline uh, understanding for the state to, uh, to really know what the situation and status is of bird diversity and bird population across the landscape of Bihar. Bihar has over thousands of uh, wetlands, but unfortunately the density and diversity are pretty uh, frail, I would say more fragile uh, in the system due to multiple reasons. And uh, let me not um, uh, forget to share with you that Bihar is the site which I was very keen to really take forward, though it was very poor, uh, poorly uh, uh, documented for birding. Uh, what excited me was it was at the crossroad, the junction of the East Asian, Australasian and the Central Asian flyway. So that that this state becomes a very valuable state for us to keep monitoring regularly, which unfortunately never happened for many decades. And uh, having initiated this kind of a program, uh, it is very, very supportive uh, and very encouraging to see how the local birding groups, the local experts who have come forward and are contributing for the cause. Secondly, I also had a very good experience uh, doing the citizen science uh, program during the COVID period uh, with the local communities uh, to gather information on the open bill stocks, the nesting, it was the nesting time. So basically we, uh, uh, we were able to map the heroneries across Bihar uh, uh, purely through citizen science, through word of uh, 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 communication uh, and pictures that were sent by the local groups. So that was a very positive thing, which I observed. Meanwhile, our major work uh, as a BNHS uh, out uh, in Bihar is uh, basically, we've initiated along with a monitoring uh, program uh, across some select uh, wetlands. We also are um, uh, contributing towards ringing, capturing of these birds, uh, both uh, land bird as well as water bird. But what I have been seeing in the last uh, couple of uh, last at least two years is that we have been able to have very good captures of pheasant species and more than that of the water bird species. Not that uh, uh, probably it was it could be efforts of ours, but then uh, 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 we have a northern passage, the movement of the pheasants around the time uh, from February, January, February. And that's when we get a lot of diversity coming in. At the same time, our capture uh, rates are also very low, not very good. Why am I uh, sharing all this with you all is just to, uh, there's one point which I want to really um, uh, strongly emphasize and that Bihar unfortunately has got uh, many communities uh, other than Mir Shikaris, other than uh, communities like the Saanis who also want to consume uh, 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 birds, especially the migratory species. So the concern here is whatever uh, comes from outside uh, uh, Bihar is most welcome and is uh, on the table. So that's one of the major concerns. Uh, our, uh, definitely, I would expect our ringing recapture rates to be also very poor. And uh, at the same time, uh, my interest is uh, to see how best uh, we could use technology like geolocators um, on the small little birds. I'm very keen to deploy, but my concern is if these birds are to be uh, captured and uh, captured by us, deployed uh, with the various gadgets, and at the end we lose them um, as delicacy, uh, I think it's not acceptable. It's a lot of investment and a lot of wastage. So here is one big concern that I'm already battling with uh, regarding illegal hunting. So how best could we sort this out 
and take this forward so it's a it's a lot of effort um, uh, getting more strength to the existing uh, government uh, decisions and extended arms to sort this out i think we've initiated that process within the state of bihar at the same time uh, i'm very keen to deploy uh, uh, transmitters uh, on uh, some of uh, the most important um, species uh, riverine species the pratting coal uh, one of my favorites the little one and uh, they are out there nesting already uh, in this time of the year and uh, i'm very keen to deploy some transmitters but the problem is not that we don't have finances we do have finances on the program but i want to look at in last three and a half decades of my association where i did some telemetry work for the uh, wild uh, uh, kur the wild ass in run of kutch my concern is there's no change in the financial uh, levels of um, investment to such technology so it is high time within our country and i look forward to interacting with mr pravin uh, about it and i want to look at things at a much wholesale level I, and it is a required time because we're losing habitats where are these species which are not bound going to come back to the these regions again if we are losing our habitats at a very high rate so it's a great concern oh, and, uh, and if we have to do it we have to do it now we are already too late we've lost a lot of species and we are losing species by the day and i think for that we we'll have to have a lot of support from our in, uh, engineering uh, intelligentsia within our nation we can do it they do it abroad they will do it for the nation and i'm sure we will achieve it we always thought of uh, getting that kind of inputs uh, you know support from within the country you know where we would get gadgets ready made in india so i think with the present prime minister's policy of made in india i think uh, even these gadgets of telemetric gadgets geolocators geolocators are very cheap but the issue of geolocators is the recapture if my recapture rates are low i am sure i'm not i don't have that kind of time to really get that information download it to understand the stop over sites the uh, uh, energy level utility the requirements and so on so forth so uh, with that um, now i would also like to share in uh, the state of bihar we had a couple of uh, 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 i think two or three raptors uh, in the last two and a half years that uh, uh, came in from one came from mongolia the other from bangladesh which were tagged and unfortunately uh, we need a fantastic outreach program the uh, police forces uh, brought the bird down rip the tag open thinking that they were spy birds so that caused another ripple uh, and concern um, uh, and definitely uh, uh, knowing the value of tags financially as well as uh, ecological information lost the bird also eventually died due to stress and uh, these are some of the issues which we are facing so i really look forward um, uh, to yeah, some some kind of support system uh, in near future where we need to strengthen intelligently uh, how to take care of these hunting uh, societies uh, illegal hunting groups and it's beyond control you need a political will to really manage these so whatever uh, uh, gadgets we may use we will miserably fail if we don't have the political will in whatever we are doing through the governance or through our own communities of research so this is it if you have got any more queries kindly let me know thanks thank you ma'am so i will like end today's panel discussion we have like entered into the post session timings so somya the last question which is kind of an improvised one i wanted to ask a different question to you but then you also seem to be a fit person to answer something which has just started so through the course of your educational journey and also your professional like paths you have come across multiple institutions both within india and outside and in the sense of like utilizing multiple expertise both within the country and outside like how do you foresee like something which praveen was just suggesting that can we like generate enough will power within the institutions like the tech part from engineering institutions and possibly we can kind of simplify ourselves enough for them to like do something for us like there are like students who need to do projects or something so you have been at multiple integrated firms and it will be beautiful to listen your views on that thank
your mind so yeah sorry i i was part of something like this in australia uh, for three years where the organization i was working with csiro was deploying tax that was made by um, a set of engineers working with them okay uh, but the problem you know like um, with technology like this with telemetry is um I mean, it's of course technology is evolving very very fast and often by the time we do r and d and deploy we are a bit dated already okay so uh, the other challenge also is like um unless you have like a huge amount of funds at your disposal okay to kind of gather the amount of money that's required for r and d and testing of the electronics is it's quite huge okay um and ultimately the the successful tech firms in telemetry beat eops or others that have been in in the picture for some time now and who giving us stable technology that doesn't fail in the field okay and we all know the ones that we go to over and over again they basically invested in one kind of tech some years ago eops and others maybe 10 or 15 or 20 years ago they went and bought the electronics and they're selling you the same thing in in different formats okay they haven't changed the back end tech okay either the receivers your transmitters none of that's changed so um i mean it's it's good marketing it's also like uh, them getting really good at using the electronics and the the technology on hand okay so it needs what that teaches us is that it needs immense patience and also it needs somebody who's really obsessed with technology to see it through there's no doubt we have people and talent here in india i know quite a few people down south who've been thinking about this and have been interested in scaling up um, these efforts and i'm sure in a year or two we'll start or we they're probably in testing phases for some of the ideas that were floating around a couple of years ago so we'll probably start seeing indian tags and collars very soon okay but how quickly will it be scalable how what will be the cost is still a question mark because electronic r and d is 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 expensive it's not cheap and that's why those stacks and collars cost what they cost okay thanks somia that was very insightful and it means like it gave hope like and the best part was that what you shared in terms of like engineering unit and wildlife units within the same university like coming together for collaboration so the question of scalability can only be answered if we kind of simultaneously start it at multiple centers so no one center would probably survive so that is the vision with which we would end today's panel discussion we would have loved to like undergo like multiple like rounds of questions and probably taking this even forward but that gives a, a food for thought for why we should come together next time so thank you to all the panelists lovely chatting with you please continue sharing your views in there in case you can call it to the already asked questions on the squad and until we meet again thanks a lot have a lovely day over to the thank audience. you Michelle, Bye -bye. for putting this all together great efforts okay yeah. thanks yeah see you. bye hi somia hello ma'am how are you good good See you sometime. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Please, yeah. I've been here calling you guys over. I will. We are. Um, sorry, sorry to interrupt, going? Soumya. Yeah. Um, we are still live on YouTube, so I'll just wrap up this session and yeah. we can continue the conversation. Sure. Um, so uh, thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, we will now go ahead with the poster session. All our posters for today are, have been uploaded on Discord. Uh, in the posters channel, day one, 29th April posters channel. This was the last live session for the day. And uh, I would like to thank Nishant and Nikita um, for the logistics and everything, the effort that they put into this. And uh, a big thank you to all our speakers and the panelists for today. Uh, please continue to engage with our participants and other speakers on the Discord server. There is plenty of opportunity to continue talking through the next two days and for a few days even after the symposium is over. I hope uh, we can all be in touch on Discord. Um, even with the panel discussion today, um, we were running out of time, but uh, maybe more fruitful discussions can also continue on the Discord server. Um, thank you, everybody who joined us today for bearing with the tech issues. 
And tomorrow's session starts at 10 in the morning with a keynote by Dr. Ghazala. Um, that will be followed by the Atlas Symposium, uh, the Atlas Mini Symposium. Do check our schedule, which is up on the website and continue to, um, it, it may continue to be updated a little bit depending on uh, if we have any dropouts. Um, so thank you once again for joining us and see you, uh, grab a cup of coffee and join us for the poster sessions on Discord. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you.